A few weeks ago, on the occasion of Mother's Day in England, Kate Middleton gave a speech in which she talked about her experience of motherhood as being overwhelming and a huge challenge. The message that Kate wanted to convey is that despite living in a palace, being married to a royal prince, and having an army of nannies and domestic staff at her beck and call, the expectations that were placed on her as a mother and the realities of raising two small children was still something that she felt was difficult. Kate's confession was significant because in talking about the negative aspect of motherhood, she was challenging one of the rules of good motherhood, that mothers should always be fulfilled, composed, serene, and all-knowing. Now, Kate Middleton is obviously a privileged woman, and that is the main reason why she could break the silence and invoke empathy rather than criticism, judgment, or vilification. She fits neatly into the conditions of what society would consider as the ideal position to mother. She is white, she's married, she's able-bodied, she's heterosexual, she comes from the right social background, is of an appropriate age, and her children are her biological offspring. Had she been from an ethnic minority group, had she been a lesbian mother co-parenting with another woman, had she been single-handedly raising four children, had she been a teenage mother living on social assistance, probably the reaction she would have got would have been totally different. In fact, she might not have been able to express her reality because her very existence as a mother would have invited Scorn. Okay. This is Haley, my daughter, who is going to be 19 in two months' time. Usually, the reaction I get when people learn that I have an adult woman as a daughter is, wow, you look so young. And then I have to explain that I don't really hold the secret of eternal youth. And in fact, I am young-ish because I'm 36 years old. And uh, then I see them working out the mats and that <laughs> awkward pause. And uh, But then the reaction I get is usually, wow, look at you now. And uh, indeed, nowadays, I am considered as a success story in the eyes of society. I am married to my father's, to my children's father. <laughs> <laughs> I'm married to my children's father. Haley is actually doing a degree. I have a son who's doing well in school and sports. I am financially stable. I have a nice house. I even have a PhD. So my positioning in society, although once I transgressed the norms of motherhood, has somehow been normalized. This was not always the case, though. Um, Haley was born two days um, following my sociology A-level exam. I was 17, um, unmarried, and living with my parents and did not have a cent to my name. In fact, for four years, um, I shared a room with both her and my sister as I juggled motherhood, adolescence, an undergraduate degree, and a relationship. As you might have guessed today, I'm going to be talking mainly about motherhood. And specifically, I will be focusing on the rules that society imposes on all mothers. These rules regulate all women, actually, but are specifically harsh on those who transgress the circumstances uh, in which women are supposed to bear children, which are usually heterosexual marriage, financial independence, cultural capital, and a mature biological age. When Haley was nine months old, she had an accident. She rolled over, as babies tend to do, and she fell over the side of the bed, face flat on the floor. And she got this massive bump on her forehead. Literally, it was the size of an egg. And 
we panicked, as new parents tend to do, and we took her to hospital. And even now, nearly 20 years later, I can still remember the fear, the worry, and the guilt that I felt for not being able to protect her. And more so, I also can remember the look on the consultant's face when he looked at me and shook his head and spit out the phrase that I had come to dread. Children raising children. And then proceeded to grill me about how, why, and when this accident had happened. This was only one of the many experiences where my competence as a mother was questioned. And my story is far from being unique. While I was deeply affected by such negative stereotypes, my experience of stigma for a long time, I believe that it had been imbued me with this determination to prove my critics wrong. So as many young mothers do, I invested in the persona of the perfect mother, believing that I was fully responsible for the physical and psychological well-being of my child and repressing any feelings of doubt or ambivalence that might have made me look as less than perfect. This was also the reality of the young mother in my doctoral study, which centered around teenage motherhood in Malta. As part of my research, I spent two years attending a mother and baby support group, hanging out and interviewing 24 young mothers, ages 13 to 21. And in this experience, I was really impressed by the level of attentiveness and responsibility with which they cared for their children, as well as by the positive meaning that they assigned to their identity as a mother, in stark contradiction to the way that society portrayed them. At the same time, in order to position themselves as good mothers, they often felt pressured to be, to be perfect and wear this mask of motherhood. So Martina, for example, one of my participants, an 18-year-old mother, faced with her family's criticism, exclaimed, I want to do everything I can for this child, to be 100% healthy, 100% in everything. Similar, similarly, Shanice, a 16-year-old mom, disclosed before, if I wanted to go out and didn't want, feel like doing my hair, I didn't bother. But now I do mine, I do hers, I want both of us to look proper. I want to show that I'm doing a good job as a mom. Something else that struck me through the process of carrying out this research was that the challenges experienced by these teen moms often resonated with those faced by my close friends, who in their mid-30s were mothering babies, preschoolers, and toddlers. Despite the obvious differences in age, economic and cultural resources, I often noted how my friends were still regulated by the rules of motherhood. Andrea O'Reilly, one of my favorite authors, because she also shares my name, she has written widely about women's diverse um, mothering experiences, and she claimed that mothers are influenced by the ideology of sacrificial motherhood. This ideology is based on three assumptions. First, that women are natural mothers, that motherhood is essential to their well-being, that they are built in with the set of capacities, dispositions, and desire to nurture children. Secondly, is that a mother is to be the central caregiver of her biological children. And thirdly, that children's needs must always be put, second, third, last, no, they must always be put first. Through these beliefs, mothers are portrayed as icons of sacrifice and unconditional love, leading to the expectations that they should be ever-present, all giving and selfless beings. The organizers could not have timed this event better. 
as, <laughs> as many of you uh, are aware, uh, today happens to be the Feast of Our Lady of Sorrows. And she gave us a lot of trouble. She is the <laughs> ultimate symbol of maternal sacrifice. In the Maltese context, where religion is still given high cultural importance, this archetype still invokes very strong devotion and has quite a bearing on our collective consciousness. Unfortunately, the rules of motherhood promote an ideal that real flesh and blood mothers is very difficult for them to achieve. In the current context, mothers who work feel torn between their careers and their mothering roles, leaving them feeling guilty, stressed out, and utterly exhausted. Mothers who stay at home feel inadequate because in a capitalist economy, caring for children is still considered as inferior to having a career. But the good news is that motherhood need not be oppressive and can be a site of empowerment for women. By challenging the rules that are often portrayed by experts, mass media, and other institutions, mothers can reaffirm their power and practice mothering from a position of agency. They can refuse to partake in the fantasy of the perfect mother, making their experiences more authentic. And they can choose to practice alternative forms of child rearing and be confident and convinced in their sense of authority. When Haley was older, she was around six or seven, I was discussing with a colleague who happens to be a psychologist. And uh, we were talking about how she exhibited certain anxiety traits, especially when, when she was facing new experiencing, like her first day of school, for example, or going to her first uh, masquerade class, etc. And my friend ex explained to me because that it was because of the pressure that I had felt when trying to be the perfect mom, I most probably had transmitted this anxiety onto my daughter. And that was a moment when I realized that this was damned if you do and damned if you don't. So it was a turning point for me. And my approach towards mothering changed towards, through that experience. This experience helped me to overcome the self-flagellating beliefs that I had and challenge the unrealistic expectations that society had imposed on me as a mother. For many mothers, the process of challenging the status quo, similar to my experience, often starts when the feelings of resentment, guilt, and constant exhaustion makes them question and think critically about these unreachable mythical standards, the lack of support, and the unfairness of being overburdened with caregiving. Suddenly, the policing gaze of other mothers the snide comments by busybodies, the patronizing attitudes of experts and professionals, the oppressive policies and structures are met back with resistance. For me, empowerment manifests itself in a sense of conviction, an experience of added freedom, and in feelings of integrity. Sharing parenting responsibility leads to the guilt-free experience of taking care of my needs for a change. So, empowered mothering is about the mother. It is about putting her back in the picture and about acknowledging her needs alongside those of her children. It is about her feeling good about the way she chooses to mother. Equally important, it is about promoting respect for all mothers, whatever their circumstances. It is about recognizing that raising children is an essential social function and thus needs to be promoted as a central human activity for which everyone, irrespective of gender, is responsible. Ultimately, it is about believing that the personal is political. And social change can be achieved when we all take steps to support women in their journey away from maternal sacrifice. Thank you. Thank you.